Books make you hope. Books make you dream. Books make you laugh. Books make you scream. This is the Books That Make You Show, discussing books with authors and experts, unraveling the inner pages of all the books that help make us who we are. Welcome, one and all, to the Books That Make You Show. I'm your host, Desiree Duffy, and we're talking about books that make you choose your own ending because, after all, we all make choices in our lives. And since no one gets out alive, we can at least decide how our own stories should end. Our guest today is Grinnell Buzz Jitte Jarlet. He is the author of the historical fiction novel, Saving Casey. And in it, Buzz offers a deep exploration of addiction and the connections that we can find in sometimes unexpected places. Now, the novel is set against the backdrop of post-Vietnam America. And in it, a POW comes home to find that everything has changed. Then he discovers that there's this songstress who is in the midst of her own war and battles herself. Saving Casey explores addiction, recovery, and redemption in a timeless story. Now, Buzz was born on the Rocky Boys Indian Reservation in Montana, also known as the Chippewa Cree Reservation, and he helped found the nonprofit Native Project, which also serves as an outpatient drug and alcohol treatment center for Native youth. Today, he is a business owner, a father, and a grandfather who also helps guide others uh, to begin their own journey of recovery, as well as an author. Buzz, welcome to the show. Thank you, Desiree. Good to see you again. Good to see Bye. you, too. I'm excited to talk to you sure. and, and find out more because there's a lot going on with Saving Casey, isn't there? Uh, yeah, it's it's uh, pretty wild. It's uh, got a lot of lot of components to it. So why don't we start off with um, a journey of recovery? Now, in the book, there's the the main character, which I might say maybe is loosely inspired by your own story, and the other character, the KC character. They're both dealing with their own struggles. Can you talk about that a little bit? <clears throat> yes, of course. Uh, well, obviously, one is troubled by the effects of, uh, of a wartime, of wartime incidents, and the other is affected by the sudden push to stardom. And uh, if we've seen in modern times and all through history of show business and music business, you know, that can have a dramatic effect on those uh, in that realm. And sometimes it, ends, uh, it has dash, disastrous endings as well as those of us who come, those who come back from, from uh, areas of uh, conflict, uh, they carry those things with them throughout their lives and uh, you're forced to deal with them. <clears throat> In both cases, we're forced to deal with these things. Otherwise, <clears throat> it usually does not end well, if you yeah. understand what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think too, I want to talk about this a little bit more later. You do something very unique with your book where you allow the reader to choose their own ending. And I want to get into that a little bit more in a little bit. But first, can we talk about a little bit about that, that journey of recovery and why sometimes isolation happens? Because I think that's a theme in your book too, is these, these characters in many ways are, are feeling isolated, aren't they? It's kind of a natural tendency for uh, for folks who are facing recovery issues or in early recovery, and sometimes beyond, depending upon what's going on with them, to isolate. It's comfortable to isolate. We get away from society. We get away from our family. You know, we, we hold up at, at wherever and just stay out of the stay out of the way of life, and uh, obviously that's not the path to healthy growth, any stretch. So that's what happened as a natural. Why don't you set the stage a little bit and tell us what's going on in the book? I know when we talked a little bit about a POW coming home, um, and maybe you also talk a little bit about there's the songstress on the radio and who the underlying inspiration for that is. Yes, uh, 
<clears throat> starting with the songstress, that obviously it's written loosely around Karen Carpenter, uh, which is another story. Uh, suffice to say that uh, we'll cover that later, maybe. Uh, in, the, uh, in the book, actually, the way I wrote this thing is I started off with the two meeting for the very first time. <clears throat> he coming from being a POW and her uh, on the way to uh, on the way to fame on the elevator up, and of course they're both bringing their troubles and they meet in this common place, and the that scene is very dramatic, and uh, then I wrote it from there both like both ways, so it was very interesting, but I wanted to have that kernel of 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 that meeting in the middle of that thing is kind of like the centerpiece for the whole thing to kind of set it off. And hopefully I've achieved that. And it's really interesting too, this whole idea of taking two people from completely different backgrounds. And like you say, it's kind of like they meet while one is going up and the other one is maybe going down. And it just speaks to the connections that we all have. And it also speaks to the connection between different types of addiction, because in the story, and even in Karen Carpenter's as a real person in her real life, she dealt with anorexia, whereas the main character in your book is dealing with uh, alcoholism. But really, those are connected. Can you talk a little bit about the research and how in many ways people that are on these different paths of recovery as well as different life paths intersect. Yeah, it, it is very interesting to notice. And, and uh, first of all, this kind of mashup with culture because you have a native person coming from Montana and then in the middle of California with, with this other person, these two people would ordinarily never meet, nor would these cultures ever really come together. Thanks to Mr. Stephen King, who gave me the tip one time that he would take two opposite things and just kind of mash them together. And, and that contrast, that collision of those two things sometimes gets very interesting. And I think that helped us quite a, quite a bit. Uh, the, uh, uh, the interesting part of, of all of this stuff about recovery uh, with anorexia and alcoholism, they're, they're very related because they both have that interesting spiritual component and that piece about a continuing recovery effort because in, in both of them, there is no real cure for either one of them. We're able to put them both, one of one each, into recovery, but that recovery needs to be maintained. There is no cure for alcoholism unfortunately, and anorexia, unfortunately, the same way. So that's where they kind of meet in the middle. Yeah, and it's really interesting when you start talking about the mystical aspects of it, too. Um, we hear a lot that people who are in recovery, people who are alcoholics, uh, when they go to meetings and such, they're supposed to have or find a higher power. Um, can you talk a little bit about this mystical thing? Is that possible to to fix us? Can we use this mystical higher power to fix ourselves? Well, actually what I've discovered for me, it is actually the root of the whole thing. And for cynical folks like most of us who are, you know, trapped in alcoholism, we don't believe anybody or anything. And if you're gonna to try to send me to church, well, hey, you better come up with a new idea because that's not gonna work. So that struggle to get to that place where it becomes acceptable is actually driven purely by pain. You know, that's the great motivator. As they say, uh, uh, pain is mandatory. Uh, misery is optional. Uh, we, we do have the, the, a choice to make at some point in time. And uh, since we realize we are at the last house on the block and there are no more chances, Ultimately, we are forced to really look at these things. And however one chooses to, to view that is uh, anything will work in the beginning. But as I've discovered too, that over time, we get to choose things because as these things are couched, they're put in terms of a spiritual program. 
And that's eventually, it means more to me different today than it originally did because I have grown, I hope, to a place where, where the spiritual aspect of things carry more weight, meaning, and they are actually to me a real thing. The native aspect piece of that is evidence of that because our, my forefathers and my grandfathers uh, believed in that, practiced that, and they turned out pretty good. <laughs> and it's interesting how native spirituality has a connection to even modern science quantum mechanics. Can you talk about your thoughts on that? Uh, you know, a guy like me, we get into the spiritual aspect of things and, and, and I'm just kind of a kind of an oddball. You know, I'll find a thread and I'll start pulling on it. And one thing leads to another, one thing leads to the next. And on the spiritual journey, I won't call it a religious journey. It's a spiritual journey that, uh, has taken me through many things, through traditional religions. I studied all that, went through that, explored that. I wound up to a place, uh, uh, now it's mostly Buddhism. I'm not a Buddhist and I'm not a practicing Buddhist, but I believe that that has a lot to it because in, in that it encompasses those things that that I really think are true. It looks, it looks at, it's very quantum. Uh, it, uh, it carries the aspects of uh, uh, most of those things. It includes looking at the stars and all those kinds of things. I don't rule anything out. And those things, uh, as I said, they take me places and start pulling these threads. Quantum reality, a whole new different look, but it ties into it. And you get the reincarnation piece. You know, I, I, trust me, I'm not a sucker. I've been around a while. I was, I was born at night, but not last night. And, uh, you know, I look at these things and I take them very seriously. Well, it's interesting that you're looking at the ways that it's connected and you're looking for that. There's so many people in this world, Buzz, who do the opposite. They decide their thing is the right thing. And they have this cognitive dissonance between anything else. If it doesn't fit their narrative, they throw it out. Whereas you're open-minded and that's really what open-minded means. You're, you're accepting and you'll take a look at, at everything, even if it seems like it might not be conforming with how people think and believe and practice worship or are spiritual nowadays. And really, uh, in recovery, we go through these different phases. Uh, uh, and ultimately, hopefully most of us come to understand that those who practice things a little bit different than, than I would or you do, uh, they, they practice their religions and that's a good thing. And it sustains them and it carries them through life, gets them through their troubled periods and all that stuff. And far be it for me to ever criticize that. I've looked at it and I just found that, well, that's just not for me. And that's okay, but it's for them. And my God, more power to them. I'll never make fun of them for that, for, do, for being that way. Now, I will say there was a time when I did. And, and that's why they call this spiritual growth. We grow beyond that, hopefully, and get to a place where it's not threatening at all. And those folks are entitled to believe whatever they want to believe. I mean, read the Bible, read the Quran, research all these things. And in the end, I went back to what they described something as being spiritual. And that's where the, where the root lies with me. Can you tell us about the time that somebody slid a beer across the table to you? <laughs> yeah, it's that uh, there's a piece in recovery where this, you know, this thing starts working and we don't know it. And, and we're so, an early recovery for everyone is so painful. <clears throat> you know, you're the, you were dropped off by aliens from another planet and it suddenly dawns on you that they weren't coming back to get you. So you have to make the best of it. So we, we continue plotting ahead and then our, our, our sponsor tells us when you get home at night and you're ready to go to bed, take your shoes off and, and get on your knees and slide them under your bed and while you're down there, say a prayer, even if you don't mean it. <laughs> okay. So, 
we we do those we do those things and we do those things and next thing you know six months later i'm in a situation in a cafe where everybody these guys sat down go for lunch and everybody nobody's having a party or anything it's a business deal and somebody slides a beer across to me and i practically jump out of my chair and ran out the door i mean where'd that come from <laughs> Because before that, I would latch on to it, never even thinking a second thought. But that's how things change for us. And that's how these, these programs are so effective if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah. And it kind of ties back into some of the thematic elements that you have in your book, too. Um, this concept of unconditional love and forgiveness because sometimes the hardest person that we have to forgive are is ourselves mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about some of the themes in saving casey that uh thing with forgiveness is very uh is very critical to recovery first of all we wind up usually blaming ourselves a guy like me comes in here so angry uh, I was, I, I had two addictions. I was an alcoholic and I was a rageaholic. I wouldn't just get mad. I would just take a bat to things and start beating them up. My cars were punished all the time because if they quit. Mm. <laughs> so, uh, my, my family, my family of origin was a little bit rough and I always was a victim because of that. I felt I was a victim and, and for years and years, that's how I felt that way. And even into five or six years into recovery, that victimization was still there and I viewed myself as that. To be able to get past that, I had to develop a way to forgive these people and actually go to them and, and not just say it. My sponsor was waiting outside in the car. <laughs> I had to go in and actually develop a plan and also get a, get the feeling that I actually really genuinely wanted to forgive them. And once that was done, I could look at myself and then forgive myself. It's not an, it's not an overnight process. It's a drawn up process, especially for a guy like me who was in that place. But most of us do see ourselves that way. And ultimately for me the ultimate breakdown is that it's kind of mirrored that way in the book with uh with kelly the pow coming finally to terms that he can't do it anymore he just literally breaks down and with your background and your history and i know there's you know you, you went to school for catholicism and you weren't necessarily raised in an environment that fostered or encouraged the creative aspect of your being. Can you talk about how you were raised and how you came to becoming a writer and expressing yourself creatively? Because there's a lot of folks who I think kind of get pigeonholed into a certain role in their life and they stay there and they feel like that's it. But you really broke out of that, that mold, didn't you? Yeah, it's. Uh, I I do believe that, uh, as I mentioned before, in, in some areas that uh, we can we come to this earth with certain features installed from the factory, and some of us take a wrong turn somewhere along the line, and those wonderful features that we were blessed with when we got here become corrupted and, and abused until they're unrecognizable once we get to a place of recovery. And uh, I, when, I, when I coach people and sponsor people, I encourage them to start looking for those things and, and reframe what they think they see might view as a character defect into something that really is a beautiful thing. You just need to shine it up and polish it a little bit and it becomes something different. Uh, for me, raised the way I was, <clears throat> obviously, it was a very, it was a somewhat abusive situation, actually very abusive. And I was the oldest of, of uh, six brothers and sisters. And uh, it was always on me to kind of watch out for things and always be on guard and to protect. Because it broke my heart when, when, when the parents disappeared and abandoned us for days. 
but it also was very scary when I got back. So we were stuck in a place where you couldn't win. <laughs> so it's very easy to, to get set up into that thing and, and take a turn where we don't see ourselves as very valuable. And then in the Catholic system, which was on, prevalent on the reservation at that time, that's where you were shoved at. Again, too, that was somewhat of an abusive system that took advantage of whatever was there. And we, a lot of us suffered from that. And that piece is in the book about, about those, those types of schools and the damage that was done. So there's a lot to recover from there. And there's a lot, to, a lot going on. A lot of folks don't make it out. The suicide rate among natives is still pretty, pretty high. And of course, alcoholism and drug abuse is still extremely high. So there's a lot of struggle and there's a lot of work left to do. And with your book, you choose, or you let, I should say, the reader choose if they want to have a sad ending or a happy ending. Can you talk about that? Because that seems really reflective in the choices that we have over our own lives. We, we can cho choose how our own story is going to end, right? Yeah, you could choose how your day is going to go. And you can start your day over any time you want. And I constantly have to remind myself of that because obviously no one's perfect. So I originally wrote the, the first ending. And I'll say that I had contemplating, I had contemplated an alternate ending, but I just didn't have the courage to do it. <laughs> so he came out with the original ending. And then as, as time went by, I thought, oh my God, I, got, I, that's, I have to, I have to change that. So rather than change it, we came up and made the decision that let's just provide the alternate ending and uh, the reader can can read both and decide which one uh, applies the best for him in, his, in their personal case. Or, you know, it's a preference. So mm -hmm. that's kind of how that, uh, how that came about. Yeah, it's a really interesting thing that you did there. Um, and it gives the, the reader a little bit more interaction with the story. Um, bravo for doing that. Can you talk a little bit about um, your message that you might have to other writers? Um, it sounds like there has been a, a certain therapeutic role for you in writing. Do you have any tips or advice that you'd like to give to its aspiring writers, especially ones that might feel like you, that their background or the job that they have isn't necessarily a creative one. Anything that you want to say to them? Yeah, and, and most of us, you know, whether you've had addiction problems or not, somewhere in our lives, we've had people discourage us from doing things that we felt we wanted to do. Uh, whether we wanted to dance, whether we wanted to write music, whether we wanted to write a book, be an artist in some way, shape, or form, and we were discouraged, you know, the deal was you better go get a job. <laughs> and so that stuff gets left behind. And and I think we, in my case particularly, this this writing thing was literally squeezed out of me by by a spiritual moment that I had one night. And, and uh, I, I, there was no other outlet but to start writing about it. And it's interesting because I'd never, this is my debut novel, I've never written a book before. So doing this thing and just going down this road was a heck of an experience. And the deal is, is don't let people discourage you. Again, we come here with these wonderful features and then as soon as we get here, people start trying to write our history for us and we have to develop enough courage to push back and take control of what we really like to do, what we really want to do. And uh, don't, let it, don't let others define us. I mean, I think that's the, the important uh, takeaway from that. And it really does boil down to courage. I mean, props to you and bravo for having the courage to, to write this book and for all that you do to help others. Can you tell us a little bit about founding the nonprofit Native Project. I'm curious to learn more about that. Yeah, that's, it was interesting. It was, uh, I think I was about three years sober and there were a group of us in Spokane, Washington that uh, had come together and saw this, this need for Native youth because there wasn't anything. And these kids were coming from 
going coming into the city from nearby reservations. And and they were all the product of the same thing that we went through as children. And we know how lost that is. And then they developed their their, their addictions rather early. So we were looking for a way to try to head that off. So we got together and we sold an old Ford Pinto as to pay for corporation uh, fees and stuff. And we started this nonprofit. It is uh, the modality we use is, uh, is the 12 recovery step as well as the cultural infusion of whatever goes on spiritually in that realm. We use that too. So it's something that those kids take to. So uh, that's always worked out. It's worked out well. And that uh, facility has expanded itself to include an, an IHS, Native Indian Health Clinic, medical clinic with actual doctors and nurses, and it's got a dental component. So it does a lot of things in that community. And it also is undergoing an expansion right now. I think it's about a five or $6 million expansion. So, and I have since retired from the board. I was board chair for many years and I've moved over across the state and I'm pursuing business interests, but it's still going and it's still there and it still does great work. It's a wonderful wonderful organization, Native Project. What a great legacy to leave behind, to know, hey, I, I was one of the people that founded that. I started mm -hmm. that. And, and likewise with your book. I mean, how wonderful does it feel like seeing your book, holding it? Uh, it's an amazing, beautiful cover too. It's just got to make you feel so good, doesn't it, Buzz? Yeah. It's, you know, there's still some of that old stuff that goes on with guys like me. It's like, <clears throat> You know, I want you to see me, but don't look at me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I don't look at my 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 work, but it really is. It's an amazing book. You are incredibly creative, uh, inspiring to talk to. You're putting out so many good things into this universe for people of all faiths um, and different levels of their spiritual journey. Thank you for doing that. Can you let people know where they can go to find out more about you, Saving Casey. Can you give us your website and your details? Well, they're Saving Casey, www.savingcaseythestory.com will help out. Uh, if you're interested in business stuff, you can go to www.sundancerelectric.com. That'll take you to, you know, look at a company that, that was started in 2012 and and it's uh, doing pretty well today. It's doing very well today. Just a little itty bitty company I started. Mm -hmm. Now it's huge. It's enormous. Buzz, you are an amazing human. Thank you so much for being with us today on the books that make you show. Thank you very much, Desiree. I appreciate it. You bet. And thank you, everybody else, for joining us as well. You can find out more about us on our website, which is booksthatmakeyou.com. We're on Facebook and Instagram on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to our Webby award-winning newsletter and never miss a show with great guests like Buzz. Until next time, all of my bookish buddies, please enjoy all of the books that make you exactly who you are. The host and executive producer of the Books That Make You Show is Desiree Duffy. Sound mastering and engineering by Dave Napox. Social media and content promotion by Siddhi Jahagirdar. Copywriting and editing by Mike Robinson. The Books That Make You Show is an award-winning podcast produced by Black Chateau Enterprises.